Hi, I'm Jay Yoon, Tan Jay Yoon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about, well, my talk's going to revolve around Swift literals. So it's Swift literally. Sorry. So what is a uh, literal? Uh, so this will be really basic, but you guys will be coding Swift forever. So this is a literal, right? Just type 42 into Xcode or Playgrounds. It's a literal. What kind of literal is it? Um, it's actually an integer literal. All right. Um, the reason why I say it's an integer literal is because there are other types of literal. Um, float literal, string literal, boolean literal. Um, and of course, our famous uh, new literal, uh, which a lot of people don't realize was only added in Swift 1.1 onwards. Um, I was there from day one, like uh, from Swift 1.0, and they were having problems with nil being nested into an optional. Like say if you do int, question mark, question mark, if you assign a nil, it becomes a sum uh, as an SOME. So it's a valid new value, which doesn't make sense. Um, and the only way they could overcome it was to actually invent a new literal. A um, little bit of demo. Close it from your back side. Close it? If you need to close this window, you close one there. No, not happening. <laughs> yeah, I think it. I need to move it across. There you go. Yeah, it's not mirroring. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just a non mirroring thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see, it says 42, right? Um, but that's not the only type of literal. Um, can type literals in hex too. That's one. Right. Oh, it's only two, two. <laughs> um, as well. If this is really boring, I promise you there's a payoff here. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's for the to in optos. Yeah, it's for the two Anyway, so. These are all integer literals, but different ways of representing them. Um, some interesting things about literals. Um, a literal is a source code representation of your type, right? So your, your value is actually represented in text, hard-coded into your source code. Now, to, to wrap your head around it, um, say I have a float value, right? 42.0, and I get 42. <coughs> So I ask you, so what's the, what's the precision of this? Um, so if I cast it to a float, um, it'll be single point precision, right? Okay, extend it. So what do you think this will be? So it's actually cat, right? Because it's cast into a single point position. Now what if I change it into a double? Ah. Um, it gets extended. So what is the precision of the vitro? It's actually infinite. It's as long as your text file or your source code can store these values, it has that precision. It just gets truncated when it's cast. So very well. Right? Into this. Right? Now that's a very interesting thing to say, right? Because when you assign it, a compiler actually then tries to infer its type. 
So even if you don't um, if you don't put anything here, uh, this is what a Swift compiler by default uh, refers. Which means this type is actually different from this type. This is a Swift type, but this is a literal type. And that's why um, your float literal has infinite precision. Right? Now, if, if you're a good engineer, you would have spot a mistake here already. Um, this will give a compiler error. Now, what does that mean? It's because all these literals uh, give enough information for the Swift compiler to find out what type to cast uh, it into. But for new, it needs two types of information. It needs to know um, what kind of uh, optional it is. Uh, it knows it's an optional because it can be new, but what type of optional it is. All right. So if you make, if you give it another information here, like, oh, it's an int optional, uh, this will work. Full optional, string optional, boolean optional. Uh, this reinforces the idea that this type is not the same as what you see here. This is compiler inferred. Um, th those are not the those are the only scalar uh, literal types, but there are complex literal types like an error literal. Um, and it's somewhat like the new literal in the sense that it's not enough information, um, but it can infer it from whatever you type for. So here the compiler is inferred it. That it's not only an array, uh, but it's also an int array. And likewise, this is a dictionary literal. The compiler inferred that it's a dictionary that's keyed with a string. The value is boolean. So if you really think about it, um, all the earlier literals you see, the literal alone was enough, um, sort of enough to give the information. Um, but here you, you need two types of information, and here you need three types of information. That's it. There's nothing else to talk about Swift literals, literally. Um, but. <laughs> If we're talking about another language, uh, I'm done. It's time for me to sit down. But uh, Swift is amazing, right? So here's the rest of the talk. So today my talk is about literal convertibles. So not literals, but Swift literal convertibles. So what are Swift literal convertibles? Now back to this slide. As you can see, <coughs> we now know that a, a, a literal type is different from a Swift type, right? Uh, we can coax it. So here when we say R, it's a float. You'll cast it in a float, it's a double, and you'll cast it in a double. Not that it really matters here because you know, an integer literal doesn't have precision. Um, but um, does this work? Can you assign 42 to a string? Um, and does this work? Can you assign a float to an int? Let's find out. <laughs> ah, you minimize. Should I switch back to mirroring? Is that faster? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. You can change from your side. You can change from that one. Can't see though. Just tap to it if she's on there. Okay. Tapping around. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so we asked ourselves just now, right? Can we do this? No. Obviously, you know, uh, but can we do this? No. Can I do that? Now, can you do this? You can. Why? I don't 
verträgt. Ah. The answer is something called an integer literal convertible. All right. And an integer literal convertible is actually a protocol. And the int type conforms to this protocol. And all this protocol has is just an initializer. All right. And take note that the uh, initializer takes um, an integer here. Um, but you can apply it to anything if you think about it. Anything that takes a protocol can take an integer literal if you apply this protocol. Int conforms to integer literal convertible. Right. <coughs> now this, uh, we know that worked, right? And that's because float um, conforms to integer literal convertibles. And double also conforms to uh, integer literal convertibles. Alright, that's fine enough. <sighs> Playground level again. So this is for people who don't really dive into code that often. So let's do this. This is how I find out everything anyway. Jump. All right, so this is the actual standard library. So I like a bit, right? Um, int itself does not conform to um, integer level. This thing called the sign number type um, conforms to it, but Int and then inherits this protocol. All right, so that's because um, the reason why it's done like that is because there are many type of ints. There are unsigned ints that ints. Then there's in eight, in sixteen, in thirty two, in thirty four, and they all separately conform to integer literal convertible elsewhere, um, and then they all get absorbed under the int type. Um, but the double is more straightforward. You can see it's an extension here. The float here. And you can see um, struct int. That nowhere here um, and anywhere else um, does the int guy conforms to float literal convertibles. And just by not conforming, you cannot assign a float literal to an integer. Uh, that's it. That's all there is behind it. There's no magic. I mean, this is magic. But that's the only magic. <clears throat> so what actually happens is um, when you conform to a protocol, um, the compiler is a guy that goes around checking, oh, hey, there's a literal here. Um, I wonder if I can find out what the type is. It actually looks at everything in your code and in the standard library um, for types to coax whatever literal you assign uh, into. Uh, and when you can't find it, you just say compiler error. All right. And as we know, those are the reasons why. Um, all these checks are done during compilation, so you can argue that they are actually special case protocols. And why, why do I call them special case? It's because um, these are the only type of literal convertibles um, that you can have. You can never write your own literal convertible. Um, this is hardwired into the compiler. Right? So every time uh, compiler sees an array, it's going to look for array literal convertibles, uh, for booleans, for dictionaries, <coughs> skip this one, for floats, integers. Every time it sees this, 
it will hunt for everything um, that conforms to this and see if it can assign. And if it can't, it will just break. Right? Um, these three are interesting. This string natural components, uh, and I'll explain why later. Um, actually, uh, just to tell you briefly, uh, string natural components conform to, uh, it's like a super protocol of this guy, and this is a super protocol of this guy. And I'll explain why later. Now, this is quite interesting, and this is very different from other languages because you would think something like Metros is hard coded into the compiler of the language. Right, but it's not because um, crit, lesson, crit lessness vision for Swift uh, is to have a very small core language, very small set of features that they implement in a compiler with a really large standard library um, implementing the rest of the features. And we find something that's usually, and I believe probably still in every language out there, that's fundamentally hard coded, um, is actually implemented in protocols uh, using Swift. So you, can, you know, you can really, really, that's how deep down you can go just by looking at the standard library and find out why things are behaving a certain way. Um, so are they useful then if you can't make your own little compatibles? Um, they are useful because you can apply those protocols, you just can't make your own. All right. So how are they useful? Um, what if I told you that hard coding always means you're using literal compatibles? Think about it. Every time you write a hard coded lab, uh, value, it actually goes through a literal convertible somewhere. All right? So you can probably infer what this guy does. Um, you think, oh, hard coding is bad, right? Good engineers don't hard code, they make everything dynamic. I'm telling you, good engineers do hard code, right? In fact, good Swift engineers religiously hard code knew where they belong, right? Because Swift is a safety type language, right? <coughs> this doesn't work. We have try to do this, and we, and we, we tell, this is to remind ourselves, oh, this guy can be new. And here we are hard coding a value already. I mean, if you put this in a class, and you don't do this, the compiler puts it in for you anyway, you know? So who conforms to new literal convertible? Um, the optional guidance. So this is just syntax sugar for what gets transformed into this guy. Um, if you look into the SDK, you can see very clearly. Um, new literal convertible just needs this initializer. Um, and then you can do something like this sort of assignment. Um, it's not uh, as widely used as you think. Um, the only other types that conform to new literal convertibles are actually pointer types. So like unsafe pointer, unsafe mutable pointer. Um, when new actually does make sense in those contexts. So it's not like, oh, we have new now, let's abuse it everywhere. No, uh, it's only optional and pointers. That's the only place you can do something like this. Um, the other really common one <coughs> that we know and love is uh, the every literal convertible. Um, and Swift 1.2 introduced something called a set. You know, like, oh, sweet. I can assign them, like, you know, I can use the syntax. Um, but do you guys know what actually happens when you do that? Right. I'm sure you do, but. <laughs> Let's just pretend we don't. So here we initialize an A to array. Now using the same literal. We now initialize a set. If you notice, one is missing because it's a set. It's like, oh, why is that happening?
That's because the set is, well, set, and things cannot be repeated. They are unique, right? The interesting thing is, it's actually using array to initialize sets. So you can, you can think of it as syntax sugar, right? There's no hard-coded set literals. So, you know, the, the language gods said, oh, things are fine. If, if there are some unique stuff, we'll just pull it out anyway. This is such a nice syntax. We don't invent another literal code. Uh, and here we are. And the reason why uh, we can do this, um, using this somewhat idiomatic way of initializing sets, is because they decide to you know, implement this protocol on the set type. <coughs> okay, but... So, right? Well, that means if you have any collection types um, that you write yourself, and you think, hey, actually, you know, it will be really sweet if I can initialize it with an array. Um, I'm saying you cannot. Um, so here we have a very contrived queue. Um, oops, wrong one. All right, here it is. Um, it's very straightforward, right? Create a struct, it's backed by an array. Um, before you command, it's actually very inefficient. This is just for pedagogic purposes. <laughs> I push a value into the queue, it appends. I pop it, it takes out the first. So it's, it's a queue, right? It's first in, first out. Um, and it counts, which counts the array elements. Now, <coughs> how do you use it? So the only way to... Actually, let's not do that. This is like this. So say say I create an initializer. It just takes an area, right? We've done this heaps of times. We create our own collection types. Uh, we write init function, and this is how we construct our collection. Um, and because we made it generic, uh, we can take strings, we can take whatever we want, um, as long as they're all the same type. Um, well, this is kind of verbose, right? I mean, the queue is pretty straightforward. Um, if I tell you, oh, this is a queue, you can immediately imagine, you ah, this is the first guy, this is the second guy. I can imagine this is a queue. So all we have to do is just implement this um, protocol, and then queue conform, and can immediately do something like this. And the compiler knows how to infer type as well. So this is really, all it is is actually just syntax sugar. Um, you're saving like this amount of characters. Um, but when the mental model of a literal really fits the type that you're trying to make, um, it makes a lot of sense to do it like that. Anything? Oh, that's interesting. That's if I make my own type. Though, can I extend existing types? Right? Can I can I write an NSURL and, and just assign a string to it and create an NSURL? And if you go online, you will find uh, this article um, by uh, Matt Thompson at NS Hipster, and he'll show you something like this. Uh, if you make NS URL conform to string, you can do something like this. You can immediately extract the host out, and you'll get this back. It's like, wow, that's insane. All you have to do is just extend, all right? Anything? 
And you start digging into the article and it's like, hang on, this doesn't really look like a string literal convertible that I know. Um, because it's been deprecated. <laughs> um, these APIs were all deprecated in Swift 1.1, so it was ages ago, it was 2.2 originally. Um, they stopped. I'll explain why. All right, so this was Swift 1.0. And any type that implements these two functions can take strings uh, and, and, you know, initialize itself or something. Uh, from Swift 1.1 onwards, um, we turn it <coughs> from that to this. They think, oh, why can't I do that though? Why can't I just extend NSURL with an init? And if you know enough about Swift, you actually can't do that. Um, you can't extend any class, even your own class, um, with initializers uh, because it's. They want to guarantee that any initializer that you implement will be used by a subclass, and when you extend, uh, that you break those guarantees. Now I think Swift 3.0 they are. They're coming back to that? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So it's still exciting. <laughs> Right? So it's very unfortunate that we can't extend uh, uh, existing classes because we can't write initializers um, in extensions. So is this still useful? All right, let's, let's just see. Uh, okay, let's try to make it useful, right? So everyone has done this, right? All right, I can't extend it, but I can subclass it and then conform onto it. Does this work? Yes, it does. So in this example, you implement these three functions and you can do something like this. And it behaves the way we expect because it's a superclass of, it's a subclass of NSURL. We can extract figures like that. Um, but we can't do dot post or dot scheme because this is a string. Uh, but is it useful? Is that useful? I don't know. How about, how about this guy? Well, I've done this heaps of times. My designer comes along and says, no, I don't want bright red. A little bit of green and a little bit more of blue, red, green, blue. Yeah. It's like, okay, let me write something like this. And they're like, it's really long, right? You think about it. What is this, right? This is a string. But what is it a string of? It's a string of hexadecimal characters, right? It's a 24-bit integer encoded in a string. It's like, why are we encoding integers in strings? Why can't integers be integers? Sometimes we put hash here. Hash means number. It's a number. So we are using strings. We can make this into a string literal convertible. Um, what about making it to an integer literal convertible? Right. So we can do something like this. We can say, all right, let's take a value and we do some bit shifting and we hard code the fact that, you know, these two numbers are always red, these two numbers are green, these two are blue. And we can initialize colors like that. This looks pretty clear to me. You know? Um, bonus is, you know, this won't compile because there's R, and R is not a hexadecimal, uh, hexadecimal digit, right? Isn't that better than this? So now you get some sort of type checking there as well because you are initializing um, something that's represented by numbers as from numbers. Um, there are downsides, right? First, you hard code the fact that it's re always red, green, blue. What if I want alpha and alpha? Ah, okay. Now I have to check range. And if it's bigger than a certain number, then maybe as an alpha. Oh, that's weak. Um, what if I want it to be a different order, right? RGB is just one order. There's, in video, I think there's red, blue, green as well. And lots of fancy other CMYKs and all that. 
But here it's not down to one representation, and you always initialize it uh, in RGB. <coughs> okay, that's a con another contrived example. And this is the next contrived example. This is an very literal convertible example. Um, and we think of, you know, the moment we think of errors, we think about collections, right? We're actually, an annex index path is kind of like a collection, right? It's, it's a collection of two integers, always two. It's like, oh, that's, that's pretty easy. You know, I've typed this tons of times, right? Especially if I'm hard coding, uh, you know, a, a static table. And this autocomplete always fails. I don't know why. <laughs> Every time you type for row, nothing shows up. But that's because it's a UI kit edition. Uh, and somehow the compiler doesn't like going there. Ah, oh, I don't care about additions. So I always have to look this up in the documentation and, and paste it. Um, but I don't have to if I initialize it that way. And you can access it like you normally do. Because only the constructor was painful, right? And you solve that with every literals. So if you think about it, um, it's just syntactic sugar. Right? For for times like when you forget or it doesn't map well to your brain or constructors are verbose. Um, and, and the literal is very, very clear. And as long as the types match up, um, <coughs> uh, as you can see here, um, you have to tell oh, your class. Yeah, you have to tell your class uh, what type it is. Um, so it unwraps this guy and gives you a variety uh, function. Um, so you, I can't send floats in there because you know I already type cast it here. And as long as they match up, uh, it'll work. Now what if, what if I only gave one value? Um, what does an index half with one in it mean? It doesn't mean anything. So maybe initialize a zero. What about those with three? Or well, three makes sense. Um, there are index paths. Actually, a lot of people don't know. But index paths can go on forever. It's just that we are used to section and row. So those mean something too. Oh, yes, here's a weird one. <coughs> now, it's weird because it's missing the word literal. Uh, it's also weird in other ways because it's not a literal convertible. Uh, because it doesn't really have much to do with literal um, directly. It's actually used by the string literal convertible uh, protocol. Now, say, say I have this enum as a zodiac. I say happy year of the monkey year or whatever, right? Uh, can you guess what this prints? I set string as my raw value, my base representation. Any guess? What does this print? No guess? Why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my guess it's the monkey emoticon, right? You can tell it's wrong, really. the name of the enum. Why? It's a string. <coughs> this is this protocol. And the only class that implements it is um, string. Um, what actually happens when you put 
object of a certain type in an interpolated um, syntax, whatever we call it. Uh, it tries to find out what type it is. And obviously, Zodex is not here, right? I wrote it. Um, so it falls back. Um, when it falls back, uh, it detects it's an enum, and it will print the enum's name. So even if it's big, it can be any base, right? It's based in int, base in whatever. As long as it detects this enum, it will actually print the name of the iman rather than what's underlying it. So to say, but I want a raw value. How do I do it? Um, so remember, I said you can't extend. You can't extend initializers, right? Um, but you can overload them, right? I can overload. Another initializer that takes a zoo there. And I say, when you see this guy, print a raw value and assign it to myself. So the way it works is every time the, um, the compiler finds an uh, interpolation, um, it will try to find out what it can convert. <laughs> How to convert that into a string? So it always converts into a string, right? And here we are telling you to convert a string, turn it into raw value. What's the raw value? Raw value is a string, right? So ah, oh, then it actually this guy then hits another function um, that we saw earlier um, that confirms a string, and then it checks out. So if you have some fancy types that you put in your interpolation, I don't know, for your console output or whatever, and you're wondering, oh, shit, how do I get it to print or whatever, I don't want to type raw value everywhere. Um, you can hijack the string interpolation and override it here. Okay, so when you use it, I know this all sounds useful, somewhat useful, maybe not useful, but if you think about it, um, it's all of this is syntax sugar, right? So well, every time you find it's a pain to initialize something using constructors or whatever, right? Um, and you just want to initialize it literal, you can always, always fall back on literal commodos because that's literally what the standard library used to initialize its own um, types from literals. Now what does this mean? Um, I mean, this is Interesting another way, right? Um, it's useful for DSLs. And why do we need DSLs? Now, I mean, the amount of times you type CG point bracket x, y, right? And, and the amount of times in object you type CG point mate, CG point zero. Right? If you make a type called point or a struct uh, called point that conforms to an every literal, literal, literal convertible, you can do this. And this is what I mean by DSL. Uh, because it's math, right? We know that if it's a point, this makes sense, right? We don't need some special constructor describing exactly what it is. We, we know implicitly this x is y. So it really makes sense here in this sense. So as a math DSL, this makes sense. Um, likewise with a matrix, right? It's like, oh, when do I hard code? Well, you do hard code because origin is always 0, 0. And the identity, the 2D identity matrix is always, you know, 1, 0, uh, 0, 1, right? So when you write your game or whatever, you can initialize it that way. Likewise with uh, string representations. Because we think of regex, if you've done enough regex, right, you, you can actually read this. <laughs> or maybe not, you still rely on some help. Um, but this, this contains enough information uh, about the regex. Um, you don't have to decorate it with, you know, start with, end with. Um, the string itself encodes all the information you need. And in circumstances like this, uh, imagine a regex type. And it's an email regex to check whether it's a conforming type email. You can just initialize it that way. And it makes sense, right? Uh, like, like how it makes sense for URLs. The URL string itself has enough information to tell you what it is. Um, a package, for instance, um, if you've done enough, uh, not so much in Swift, but like Ruby, Python, even Go now. Uh, this makes sense to you. Right, this is the package, major, minor, patch version, um, compatible with. Right? This is a DSL. And 
even anything, right? I don't know how often you guys play with NS character sets. I do. Um, when I'm checking, trying to strip characters and all that. Initializing NS character sets has to be one of the most verbose parts of the Coco API. And, and when, I, when I saw this example online, I'm like, that's brilliant. <laughs> why, why can't we have this? <laughs> right? It's a bit like, you know, seeing this for sets. When, when set first came out, right? It's like, ah, oh, shit, I have to use a constructor to keep typing all these values in. Then when you, you could assign it as an array, it's like, ah, oh, so much cleaner. So likewise here, right? Um, you don't lose any information. Um, writing like this doesn't make me understand it less. It clearly is a character set, like a set, but with characters. So what do I mean by, why is this important? Like, I think, it's interesting, this is an interesting phase we are, we are moving into with Swift, right? Swift 3.0 is coming out, it's open source, whatever. And we're starting to see it on the command line. Thankfully, I lined up this talk with this gentleman's talk, right? So I could um, make a case for um, text-driven ways of using Swift, right? So in this case, scripting. And this is helping you hard code, right? So you look at the Swift package manager now, and this is not all not for me, right? Um, and this is the example on Apple's website. Uh, not Apple's, but more on the Swift website. And you're creating this package struct, I mean, uh, with these values. And these are enums with these associated values. I mean, anyone coming from Ruby or Python will think this is just absolutely insanely verbose. This part, it's just to specify packages. I don't know, maybe with Swift string, string literal convertibles, you can condense it to something like this. That's a really stark difference, you know? The readability of this guy and this guy. And it's not hard, right? So what is this? This is an area of dependencies. It looks like an enum, right? So, well, just make this guy conform and you'll know how to parse this guy. So yes, it's split into things like URL, major version, or whatever. Or maybe like, compatible with maximum, minimum requirement, or whatever. And you can encode it in a string BSL. Right, GitHub, from Apple. They say it must be version 1.0, or anything compatible with 1.0. Right. Maybe it'll work, maybe it'll not. Who knows, right? Um, yep. <coughs> and I know, I'm not making this up, right? If you use Cartage, um, this is exactly the syntax they use. This is, I took this from Cartage. <laughs> and enough people know Cartage to, um, to understand this. So it's not like, ah, oh, we have to invent all these new, uh, you know, new conventions to learn you know, and it's increasing the learning curve. Yes, every time you introduce the DSL, you are increasing the learning curve, unless that DSL is a widely known DSL, like math, right? Everybody learns math before they learn programming, so it's actually more painful to then learn, oh, I can't use brackets, I have to use point bracket to initialize a point. Um, so in this case, this is another widely used DSL uh, that makes sense in this context, right? And I would think it actually reduces the learning curve if you use it right. Um, which is crazy, right? Like, if you think about it, we are the only language that uses something this verbose to initialize packages. You look, you look at Ruby Gems, no, not like that. Uh, Python, Py, not, not like that. Go, go get, it's not like this. Anyway, so if it's open source, so go ahead and contribute a string that throws a convertible if you want. Um, that's all there is to it. So, questions? Hopefully I can convert them to answers. Question on the set? Yes. So, let me have this duplicate element scene and automatically it. No, actually it doesn't recognize it at the literal level. It's actually syntax sugar for... So when you do that, right, it then looks at set. And you actually convert um, that um, into a set constructor. 
So it passes those values into a set constructor, and then the set initializes and feeds out the value. So the function, the struct itself, still does the work. So it's not the compiler. How does it detect the duplicates? The set, the set uh, itself. The elements are not confirmed uh, to the critical protocol. It doesn't have to be. I think they do. Like a. Uh, it should be hash. Yeah. Hash is also equivalent. Yeah. So if you, so okay, let me just jump back to the Harry for the most part. No, I'm not here. Not here. So what happens here, right? The compiler actually takes apart whatever you wrote up here and puts it here. So when you initialize a set like that, it actually goes init element, init elements one, two, three, four, one. It's still there. So what, what do you mean that other than is it actual? No, no. no the, the definition of the struct set element, and then this guy. It conforms to any little form of it also conforms to the actual. Yeah, so I'm 100% sure that set uses hash. Yeah, so it must conform. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then it gets stripped up in here, of course, after checking the hash. Good question. Thanks. Okay, cool. We're done. Thank you.